The Clyde Beatty Show. The world's greatest wild animal trainer, Clyde Beatty, with another exciting adventure from his brilliant career. The circus means fun for both young and old. Thrills, excitement, snarling jungle beasts. But under the big top, where Clyde Beatty constantly risks death in the most dangerous act on earth, you see only part of the story. Much of the real drama takes place behind the scenes of the circus, or in faraway places of the world where this master of the big cats has journeyed, hunting down his beasts in their native jungle. All of this is part of the Clyde Beatty story. Here is Clyde's adventure with Curse the Clown. Harriet and I were in Hollywood making a wild animal motion picture. Harriet was in the big steel training cage on the set, whip in one hand, chair in the other. From outside the cage, George Burt, the director of the picture, was calling instructions. All right now, Harriet. Back away from him as he advances. Mm -hmm. Just take it as slow as he'll let you. Huh. Like this, George? That's swell. No, don't turn sideways. We want your full profile of the camera when we shoot the scene. And use your whip, Harriet. All right, George. Yeah, that's swell. That's the way we'll shoot it. Crouched eight or nine feet in front of Harriet was the thing at which she waved her chair and cracked her whip. It slowly advanced as she stepped backward. It snarled, roared. Back now! Back! Stay back! Back there! And then the thing began to talk. The thing was I. Keep going back, Harriet. Bear to your left. Get in range of the safety cage door. Oh, yes, Clyde. You'll need that door when they're Get shooting back. the scene and it's a real lion in here in the cage with you instead of your husband. Oh, I, Clyde, I think you make a ferocious lion. You scare me to death. Do I, honey? Oh, no, back. Back down, Clyde. <laughs> okay. That's very realistic. That's how we'll shoot the scene. That's enough. <laughs> then come on, Harriet. Let's get out of the cage. All right. <laughs> well, oh. that was swell. Thanks, Clyde, for pacing the scene out with us. Well, the pleasure was mine. You know, it isn't often a man gets a chance to roar at his wife. <laughs> no, I, I guess it isn't. <laughs> you know, George, that was the way Clyde taught me to work the big cat. He'd take the role of the animal and back me across the cage. Well, an animal trainer has to memorize every inch of the cage so he can back across it without looking. You don't take time to look around when you're facing 20 or 30 lions and tigers. Well, this morning, anyway, when we shoot the scene, there'll only be one lion in there with Harriet. Sultan. Yep. That's one tough cat. Yeah, but it's your best-looking lion, Clyde. It'll photograph swell. Sure. Well, I'll get over to the grotto and get Sultan into the portable cage so the grips can wheel him over here for the scene. Okay, Clyde. I started for the other end of the huge sound stage where the second unit of the company had been shooting process shots of Sultan in a plaster of Paris grotto. Halfway down the sound stage, I began to run. Yells of horror and screams for help had suddenly begun to come from Sultan's grotto. In a moment, Clyde Beatty will return with his story of Curs the Clown. Here again is Clyde Beatty. Yells and screams broke from Sultan's Grotto. I ran, seeing grips, cameramen, gaffers, actors milling in confusion at the rim of the grotto, hearing Sultan's enraged roars blend with the human cries of fright and horror. Then, before I could reach the spot, a man in a ragged clown costume grasped a steel pole and calmly vanished into the lion grotto. Masterson, the assistant director, rushed to meet me. Mr. Beatty! Oh, thank heaven you're here. What's happened? One of the cameramen fell in a few seconds ago, and the lion attacked him. And then... And then the guy in the clown suit went to the rescue. I saw that part He's of it. one of the extras. Oh, Mr. Beatty! I'm... All right, take it easy, Masterson. Just help me push through the crowd. Yes, sir. All right, let me through. Come on, let me through here. Yes, let Mr. Beatty get through. All of you! All of you! Let Mr. Beatty get through! <laughs> It was a 12-foot drop from the overhanging ledge into the pit of the false stone grotto. Luckily, I brought my animal whip. I gripped the whip stock, slipped over the ledge, and dropped into the pit. 
But I had no need for the whip. As I regained balance on the uneven grotto floor, I saw the ragged, tall man in clown costume cut off the lion's charge expertly. And his manner, his handling of the steel pole told me he was in command of himself and of the lion. He called to me, still facing Sultan, without turning. If you will help the unconscious man... You can manage the lion? Yeah, boy, I manage, I manage. Good. Then I'll get the cameraman out of here. I went to the unconscious cameraman. Sultan hadn't mauled him. He'd fainted from fear. There was a grilled door in the grotto wall, and through it I dragged him to safety. Then I went back in. No doubt you will cage the animal now, Herr Bader. I'll have his cage run up to the other end of the grotto tunnel, then open the door at this end and send him through. Good, good. Yeah, yeah. That, that is how to do it. It was as if the shabby clown and not myself were the lion trainer. But when Sultan had been run out through the grotto tunnel and caged, the clown would identify himself only as... I am cursed, the clown. But you must have worked wild animals before, the way you handled... I am cursed, the clown. You see? Uh, I am nothing but an extra in movies. You see my costume? I am cursed. The clown. <laughs> Mind if I come into your dressing room with you a second, Clan? Oh, sure, George. Harriet's over in the makeup department, getting touched up before we shoot. We got a couple of minutes. Clyde, it's about that guy that jumped in with a lion, that actor. Well, he really isn't an actor, he's just an extra. Go on. Well, it hit me a couple of seconds ago after you told me what happened. Yeah? Here, sit down. <coughs> Thank you. Well, it's this. In the script, you compete with this old-time European animal trainer. Mm -hmm. And our problem has been that using a regular actor in the role, we, we can't put him in with the animals. We can't. He scared ten years off him. And so, so I... So I double his animal fighting scenes. Well, sure. That's how we mapped it out. And when we needed close-ups, we'd use process material of the wild animals in the background. And the actors superimposed later. So they wouldn't have to be together. But, Clyde, what I'm thinking about now is that that guy, uh, that guy, what was his name again, the extra? Kurz. Oh, it's Kurz. That Kurz, Clyde, could do the role and go right in with the animals. And the way you describe him, he sounds like he fits the part. Mm, he might at that. Yes, but there's one thing that worries me. Yeah, George? But from what you say about him, he, he may be a little hard to handle. I mean, he might not want the part. You know, sometimes guys who've come down in the world, if they're proud, hang on to their bad luck. So what I'm thinking, Clyde, is, since Kurz evidently was a trainer once, that you talk to him. You two are sort of birds of a feather. Uh, you get the idea? Well, I'll talk to him, George, if you think it'll help. You... Uh... You wish to see me, Herr Peter? Sit down, Curtis. Mm, thank you. Uh, Bert asked me to talk to you. He wants to offer you a part in the picture. Oh, I have a part in the picture, Herr Peter? <laughs> I'm an extra. A clown. Bert wants to give you a big part. I decline it. Well, that's up to you. But it's the part of a trainer, Kurz. A wild animal trainer of the old school. Please to thank Herr Bert for me, but uh, I do not The part wish of a trainer to... from one of the old pre-war European circuses. He tries to catch the spirit. What Hagenbeck, for instance, meant to animal training. Ah, uh, what do they know of Hagenbeck in Hollywood? More than you might think. Uh, he was a great trainer. Sure he was. All of us curs that are training the big cats now grew up in Hagenbeck's shadow. Uh, I knew him in Vienna. Hmm. I worked with him. Then you performed as a trainer in Vienna? Yeah. Well, Kurz, think it over. I'm going to have the story department send you a copy of the script. You might decide you want to do the part after all. <laughs> Oh, I gotta get back on the set, honey. Oh, you have time for another cup of coffee. 
Here you are, dear. The waiter left a little in this container. Harriet, I'm beginning to get worried about Curtis. Oh, you are, darling? But he's doing so well. Too well. This morning, when you were in the still department having still shot of you... Yes? Well, the second unit was shooting the scene where the old-time trainer goes in the cage with a lion. Mm -hmm. I went over from our set. Guess what was happening? Oh, I don't know, Clyde. Well, they'd paced off the scene in the cage, had the lighting all set, everything okay. Yes. And the lions had been let into the cage, and all that was left was to start the cameras rolling. And then Curtis had run in through the safety cage and in with the lions. Mm -hmm. But Bert was half out of his mind. Curtis was holding up everything. Well, why? What was he doing? Fussing with his makeup. Oh, 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 no, Clyde. Yep, he said that now that he was a movie star, he had a look right. Well, he finally got ready, then he started to go into the cage without a chair. I told him he'd better darn well nut. I should think so. I told him what the lions would do to him in there without a chair to shove him off. But he struck a pose right out of the shooting script and said, In my day, we did not need a chair. It took Bert and me five minutes to unsell him on the idea. <laughs> Well, Harriet, the second unit goes out on location this afternoon. Oh, that's right. I've checked the schedule. Kurz goes with the unit on location. They're going to start shooting the outdoor stuff up in the mountains tomorrow. I stay here at the studios with the first unit till we finish the lion scenes, and then I go up. Mm -hmm. Oh, I thought we were going to drive to the mountains together. Honey, I'll feel a lot better if you go up with the unit today and keep an eye on Kurz. Oh, what do you want me to do? Well, they'll shoot the fight between Kurz and Himmy the first thing tomorrow morning. Yes. Now, Himmy can be pretty darn mean. Somebody like our director, Bert, for instance, isn't likely to realize a bear can be just about as dangerous as a lion. No, no, that's right. Well, let Bert know how many of the best animal trainers have been killed by bears, just so he'll be wary. Mm -hmm. Tell him how unpredictable a bear is, how it never gives warning before it attacks. Well, all right. And as far as Kurz is concerned, now here's what I want you to do. First of all, tell him to muzzle Hemi. Since Hemi's a black bear, a black muzzle won't show. And then, honey, tomorrow morning, when they shoot the scene, I want you to... Well, now I guess we're about ready to go for a take. Uh, hey, where's that darn Kurt? He'll be right here, George. Oh, hello, Harry. He's bringing him in. Now, from what you've told me about bears, I just assumed it didn't bring him too close. Oh, I think things will go all right. Yeah, I hope so. Except Curz is getting pretty far out of hand. He's turned into a regular ham actor. You know, he's beginning to think he's the star of the picture. Oh, here he comes. Mm. All right, Mr. Curz is here now. We can go to work. This will be scene 84. Take one. Scene 84, take one. Curz? Yeah, you are help it. <coughs> I'm ready. Uh, no, not so close. Keep that bear away from me, please. Mr. Kurz, him is not muzzled. Yeah, no, not at all. No. Mr. Beatty's instructions were that you muzzle him with a black muzzle. Oh, now, wait a minute, Harry. If we can't show him muzzle, there wouldn't be any suspense in the scene. A black muzzle won't show against Timmy's black fur. Oh, I get it. Well, okay, then. If you'll please muzzle him, as Mr. Beatty asked. I do not need a muzzle. Please. Oh, come on, Kurz. Now feel a lot better with the darn thing muzzled. Well, uh, it's lost, the muscle. Is that the truth? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, all right, then. We'll have to go without it. Okay, the scene is in the Himalayan Mountains, and you curs fight hand-to-hand -hand with a Himalayan black bear. Now, let's go for a take. Come on, Himmy, come on. Ah, I take off your collar. All right. Picture. Hey, Harriet, how come the revolver? You won't need those blanks to shoot at any lions this morning. Mm, this revolver isn't loaded with blanks, George. Bullets. It's Clyde's idea. In case anything goes wrong. You mean in case Hemi... Yes, George. Just in case. Hemi. We pause for a message from our sponsor. Here is Clyde Beatty. Harriet, Kurz, Bert, and the usual crew of workmen, technicians, and actors had gone on location in the California mountains. 
the second unit of the company filming a picture in which Harriet and I were appearing. I had remained at the studio in Hollywood completing scenes with the first unit of the company. About 11 in the morning, the day after the location unit left, we were getting ready to do a few final shots in the cat barn setup on one of the sound stages. And are you, you going into the cage now with the lion, Mr. Beatty? In a minute, Masterson. There's nothing to worry about. But I'm not worried, Mr. Beatty. It's just that while Bert is out on location, I'm in charge. All here, you've I... got to do yeah. is tend to your technical problems here on the outside. And I'll go into the cage. But, but, uh, but excuse me, yeah, there's the set phone. Sure. Okay. Uh, stage seven, first assistant. Uh, yes, he's here. It's for you, Mr. Beatty. Thanks. It was Harriet phoning from the second unit on location. Curs had been mauled by Hemi during shooting, and in the confusion that followed, Hemi had escaped. We started immediately for the mountains. Mr. Beatty. Sorry, Masterson. I guess that was passing a little close to the edge of the road. But we're almost there now. But these roads are dangerous here in the mountains, Mr. Beatty. I know. But from what my wife said on the phone, there's a danger worse than mountain road driving to think about. There are campers up here in these mountains. And him, he's loose. And he's not in a good mood. But by the time Masterson and I reached the location unit, Hemi had been recaptured. Harriet brought me up to date on all that had happened. And then Kurz insisted the muzzle was lost. Yeah, yeah, he would, the grandstand. So not wanting to delay any longer, George started the scene. Of course, Kurz roughed Himmy up a little too much. And all of a sudden, Himmy knocked him over and began to bite him. Uh. And that was when Kurz realized how far he'd gone. He began to beg me not to shoot. He said he couldn't let me shoot a valuable bear on his account. And all the time, the bear was mauling him, Clark. Oh. It was tragic, pathetic. Kurz made such a ridiculous figure, groaning as the bear bit him, and at the same time pleading with me not to interfere. I would have shot, but I was afraid of hitting Kurz or one of the cameramen. Mm-hmm. Must have been a regular melee. Well, everybody ran in every direction. And then suddenly Himmy left Kurz and dashed off into the brush. Well, how did you recapture him? Well, we formed a search party. One of the men sighted him in a dry wash. It wasn't far, so the men carried the cage up, and we drove him into it. Say, Clyde. Yeah, George. Clyde Kurz is a little bit chewed up. And he's just got the one scene up here in location. How would you like to do it for him? Well, it's all right with me if it'll work from your standpoint. Well, we got film of him with Himmy this morning. So if we put on his costume and we shoot fairly long shots, it'll be all right. Okay, then. Uh, good. We'll go into the wardrobe tent and get ready. Right. Scene 84, take two. Everything ready, Jim? Yeah, Mr. Burke. And let's go for the take. Yes, sir. Clyde, I'm worried about your doing this. Why, honey? Well, now that Himmy's been up to bed. Forget it. It'll be all right. <sighs> Quiet, please, everyone. This the take. All right. Picture. The mountain clearing, supposedly a clearing in the Himalayan mountains, was lighted with the double brilliance of the natural sun and the deflected suns of the aluminum foil reflector baffle. Back from the clearing at careful distances, the picture crew members watched. The cameras were turning, and I walked into the clearing. At the same time, Himmy was released from behind a screen of bamboo. I played the scene in silence. Kurz would later dub his voice into the soundtrack with the growls of Himmy. And then suddenly, Himmy charged me! The doctor looked you over while you were unconscious. What did he find? I'm afraid Hemi broke one of your ribs, darling. <laughs> Nothing worse than that? Well, not that he found. Good. Well, I ought to be out of this place then by tomorrow. What is this, anyway? It was the equipment tent. They didn't bring a hospital tent up here on location, so they cleared this one out and put the beds in. Beds? Oh, there's the other one, hmm. on the other side of the screen. Oh, I see. Say, so what about Hemi? I shot. I know. I heard just as I was passing out. When Himmy hugged you and I saw he was crushing you, I shot. My first shot missed, but the second one stunned him. Only stunned him? Yes. He'll be all right, Clyde. And now... Hmm, honey? I'm going to let you rest. Try to sleep. All right. I'll look in on you later to see how you are. Oh, uh, Harriet. Yes? It's uh, hot in here. Would you pull out the screen as you go so the air can circulate? Of course. 
Harriet removed the screen from the makeshift hospital ward, and then I saw that the other bed in the tent with mine was occupied. The occupant was lying motionless and staring above him. Finally, he spoke. I, uh, I've heard from here behind the screen what has happened here, Betty. Uh, I am responsible. Oh, forget it, Curse. Right, right. Here, Beatty, the days of the old time, of the old style, are gone. We live on in the flesh, a few of us. Ah, but the spirit left us from the old times. It, 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 it makes us fools, here, Beatty. It, it, it makes us all clowns. Ah, well, eh, the flesh also, it will soon be gone. <laughs> Production on the picture was delayed, and I had to send Harriet to Florida, at that time the location of our winter quarters, to supervise preparations for the opening of the circus season. Then, just as we were ready to start filming again, another stumbling block appeared. Curse. What now? He won't continue on the picture. He won't? He is uh, disillusioned with himself. He revels in gloom, Klein. In short, he has once again cursed the clown. And you mean, George, he won't finish playing the role of the old-time animal trainer? Oh, I reasoned with him, I argued with him, but no. He says he has failed me and he cannot go on. Uh, the fact that I've already shot half the picture with him in, it doesn't seem to bother him. Well, what are you going to do? I have no idea. I'm licked. Why don't we take Kurz to dinner tonight, to the Brown Derby, maybe? Don't you think I've invested enough in him already? Look, this just might pay off, George. Mm, all right, but I can tell you now it's no use. You won't be able to persuade him to change his mind. I'm not going to try. What? Huh? See, are all animal trainers a little nuts? Uh-uh. Professional secret. <laughs> well, let's get on our way. Then. Before we leave, I want to make a phone call. Uh, what's the name of that place that can supply you with actors? Uh, uh, what? You know, where they... Uh, uh... Oh, you mean central casting? Yeah, that's it. You remember their number? Oh, it's in the book on my desk. Oh, fine. This won't take a minute. Clyde! Betty, old man, are you sure you're feeling all right? Just humor me, George, and I never get violent. Why don't you get your car out of the lot and I'll meet you in the front? Yeah. Anything you say, Napoleon? I'll tell Josephine you won't be home until late. <laughs> Central Casting, this is Clyde Beatty. I need a legitimate Viennese. Accent, appearance, the works. About 65 years old, but absolutely must be legitimate. Man or woman? Make it a woman. That'll help. Well, then, Kurz, if that's absolutely your final decision, well, we just have to let it stand. Huh? It is. I, I'm unworthy to go on. Well, then, thank you for coming here to dinner with me, Clyde. Well, I've got to run. I'll leave you two animal trainers to talk shop over your coffee. Goodbye, then, Kurz. I'm sorry it had to end like this. Well, I also am sorry, Herbert. So long, Clyde. See you on the set in the morning. Uh, yeah, sure, sure, George. Ah, Herbert, you are Herbert, the picture director. Yes? Do I know you, madam? Mm, none. But I recognize you from your photograph I have seen. I see. I have read you are making now the animal picture. Yes, yes, that's right. Ah, I must meet the animal trainer. I am great admirer. Well, madam, I'm sorry, but... Ah, I... but he is here. He sits. Here, I see. Uh, him. Madam, really, I, I must d speak to him, for I admire him. It's all right, George. Well, I'm sorry, Clyde, but <laughs> I guess you get used to the public being interested in you. Uh, who is this young man to whom you speak, Herr Bert? Well, why, it's Clyde Beatty. So, so, well, it is no matter. I come to speak to the great trainer. The great trainer. Herr Kurt, I have seen you in Vienna. I admire you. Well... Don't be, madam. You are kind. I have seen you in the old, old time. And I have to come here, Kerr, so rudely, to tell you how happy we are to mm. see you again in the movie you are making. <laughs> don't be, don't be, madam. Come on, George. These two have got things to talk about. Oh, uh, Hepburn. Huh? Uh, I, I will be on the set tomorrow morning, yeah? Uh, what's that? Oh, oh. Well, fine, fine, <laughs> yes. I'll have to hand it to you, Clyde. 
You're a clever guy. Psychology, George. An animal trainer's just a man. And when a woman starts telling him how great he is, he forgets what sharp teeth those cats have. <laughs> Clyde Beatty will return to tell you about his next adventure after this message. And now, here is Clyde Beatty. Superstition is usually harmless, but it can be a pretty serious thing when it gets out of hand. Our next story deals with our experiences one summer when some of the performers thought our show was being hounded by a jinx. And the things that happened one rainy night in Iowa almost made me agree. You'll hear the whole exciting story, Jinx of the Big Top, the next time we get together. All stories are based upon incidents in the career of the world-famous Clyde Beatty and the Clyde Beatty Circus. The Clyde Beatty Show is produced by Shirley Thomas. Curse the Clown was written by William Fifield. All names used were fictional, and any resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is a Commodore production.